Amen. All right, so the last couple weeks we have been talking about what is the Bible, what the Bible is not, how does that impact our lives. Last week we talked about what? I wasn't here. That's right. What did we talk about last week? Apparently no one was listening. Um, wait, we were talking about, um, hold on. <laughs> I'm going to give you a hint. It's been a very long week. <laughs> it has been a very long week. We talked about why do we study the Bible. We talked about what the Bible is. We talked about what it's not. We talked about how do we need to live in light of that. Last week, we talked about what the, uh, how to, uh, why we study the Bible. This week, we're going to hit how do we study the Bible. So how do we study the Bible is a fun question. Um, and it's something that really we need to take to heart because if it's really good for us to go through the Bible and to talk through things and to like want to order our lives after the Bible. The downside is, is if we don't know how to study our Bible, then that's kind of pointless, right? Like if I'm just handed a book and said, okay, this is how you're supposed to live your life, and you don't really know what you're doing with it, that book really doesn't have any help for you, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, no, yes. It doesn't have any help for you. So real quick, I'm going to put this up here. In order to learn how to know God, serve Him, bring Him honor... We must be good students of His Word. Now, I know every one of you in here is a great student. You are incredible students. You do your job at school. I'm recording this, so I'm going to say that you are good students. And so your mom and dad, when they hear like, yes, we are great students, they'll actually possibly believe it. Um, But when it comes to God's Word, you really need to be a good student of His Word. And so tonight what we're going to do is we're going to look at a group of people that I like to call Bereans. It's where Berean Christian School gets its name. Um, This passage of Scripture is actually where you get that name from in in the text of Scripture. But this group of people are different than the other people that Paul encounters on his missionary journeys. There's something simple but something huge that sets them apart from everyone else. And we're going to look at that real quick. So take your Bibles. If you have them, uh, take them and turn them to Acts 17. We're going to be in verses 10 through 12. Acts 17, verses 10 through 12. Summer, when you come back up here, you bring my coffee cup off the table. Thank you. I'm going to have the scripture up here on the board in case you don't have it. But I'm going to have it up here on the up front, but it's going to be hard to read because there's a lot of words. Look at you being a good friend. Thank you so much. Well, she handed her, well, she handed Angel a Bible too. Good friend. Good friend. Good friend. Acts 17. Acts 17. If you're looking for Acts, it's after John. After John, but before you get to Romans. After John, before Romans. We're in chapter 17. It's after 16, but before 18. If you get to 22, you've gone too far. Right, so 17. Acts 17, verses 10 through 12. And I'm going to put it up on the board, and we're going to go ahead and get started. And it says... Oh, man. It went back the wrong way. There we go. Yes, maybe. There you go. Brethren, immediate, the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Therefore many of them believed, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. So what we have here is a, is a time in Paul's life where Paul is going on a, on a missionary journey. He comes to a group of people in, a, in an area of the world known as Berea. Um, Berea has just got a, it's a, a province over in what they called Greece, that whole area of the world around the Mediterranean Sea. And it's over there that Paul goes to. And he goes and starts preaching to them in their synagogues. These are Jewish people, like people who follow the Jewish laws, but they may not actually be like born in Israel. They may be transplants to Greece, or they may be Greeks by birth, but they want to follow the Jewish law. But they are Jews that Paul is speaking to, so they are they do know the Scriptures. And so he's talking to them. He tells them, hey guys, this is who Jesus is. And they begin to go back and take what he's taught them and go back to the Scriptures and say, is this true or is this not true? 
So they're taking what Paul has, is telling them. They're listening. They're going back to the Scriptures to see if it's true. After they've done so, they go into, back to Paul, and, and some of them, and it actually says, therefore many of them believed based on what Paul had told them. So from this section of Scripture, we're going to talk about a couple things that make you, uh, that, that are important when studying God's Word. We're going to look at the Bereans and how they did these three things. One, they listened well. So studying God's Word involves listening well. Studying God's Word involves personal reading. I can't read it for you. You have to read it for yourself and take it in for yourself. And finally, studying God's Word will change your life. Like, there's no real way around it. Studying God's Word will change your life. So let's look at the first one. The Bereans, <clears throat> we're talking about listening well. So the Bereans listened well to what was being taught. So this is what you and I need to be doing. What we need to understand from them is that we need to be taking what we hear and we need to become really good listeners. We need to develop good listening habits. So how many of you in here are note takers? Like you listen to someone speak and you try to take notes as they speak. How many of you hate taking notes? All right. How many of those that hate taking notes, how, how good are you at, at the end of the conversation, being able to tell me what took place in that conversation? Are you pretty good at it? Pretty good at it? What I've realized through going to school with different people is you have two different kinds of people. You can watch them on Sunday mornings here. I encourage you to do that this Sunday morning. Just make it a, a mental note to look around the room while the sermon is going on. There will be people who will be feverishly writing. They'll just write, 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 write. You'll see Katie and I on the, you know, whatever row we end up on, just feverishly writing. You'll also see some people that are sitting there like... And the whole time they're listening to everything that's said, they're taking it in. We call those people distillers. Now, <clears throat> what's going on here is they're taking everything in at one time. They're listening to it. They're letting it mull over in their brain, and then they're putting it back together in something that they can understand. There, there's really only two different kinds of people when it comes to listening well. You're either a note taker or a distiller. We're going to talk a little bit about what, um, what makes these people, both of these are really good, but there's also some small pitfalls uh, that go along with these. But let's talk through these really quick. The, the note taker usually does outlines. It's just a simple way to write. It's really hard to write full sentences as you're trying to listen to someone. Really difficult. I've tried. I ended up having to change my handwriting when I got to college because I could not read my own handwriting because I was too, trying to write too much and too fast. So I had to change. I had to actually make it readable. Um, and I'm not a distiller. Like, straight up, I cannot do that. Like, I feel like I'm not doing something I should be doing with my hands when someone's speaking. Like, I feel like I need to be writing. Um, if you listen to the whole message and you meditate on what was taught, those guys are able to pull out a main idea from the text. So th I applaud you if that is who you are. Like, I'm super jealous of you because I wish I was able to do that. If you can, nurture that skill. Develop that skill. Grow that skill because that is a beautiful skill to have. If you're not one of those people and you have to be a note taker, work well at that skill. Take the time to do so. I would encourage each of you, if you don't already do it, on Sunday mornings, even if you're writing down just a few things that stick out to you from the passages that the pastor speak, that Pastor Dave is speaking on, write them down. Or even like a little note like, hey, I want to go back and check this later. Like those things are okay to do. It just keeps your brain engaged, your hand engaged, your whole body engaged to what's going on, and you start to remember a whole lot more of what's being taught. Um, but these are, the, these are the good side of this. Now, these people also have some common pitfalls. So those people who are distillers, pr predominantly this happens with distillers, um, but they listen to respond only. How many of you have that friend that you tell them an entire story and at like a third of the way into the story, they have a point that they want to make and they're just waiting on you to quit talking so they can throw that point in? All right, let me, let me rephrase this. If you can't think of anyone that does that to you, you might be that person. This is a common problem that I have. Like, I, I sometimes do this a lot. Um, and it's not because I don't care about what someone else is saying. It's just that I want to contribute to the conversation as much as they are. And so I feel like I need to put stuff in when in reality I just need to quit talking and let them speak. Um, and just listen. Because sometimes it's cool to listen. Um, these, this is not good. 
These people are great at interrupting conversations and inserting themselves into conversations. So you just step into a conversation that's not yours. My kids are awesome at this. <laughs> like, yeah, Macy will walk up to, to Katie and I as we're having a conversation. She will literally, like, just put her head right here on one of our legs. Like, hi. Or, 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 or Allie will come up and we'll say something and she'll only catch part of it. And so, oh, no pointing fingers. Literally, that's true. <laughs> and he's not denying it. Um, the only catch part of it. And what happens is, is that when you do that, what you're actually doing is you're wanting to contribute, which is a good thing. But what it ends up doing is it ends up telling the other person, I don't care about what you have to say. Because my input to the conversation is more important than what you're trying to tell me. And so it lowers people on, on, on our importance level. And that's not good. That's not a good thing to do. The other problem that you run into is you try to get too detailed in your distilling or your note-taking. So you end up having a situation where someone's trying to sit there and they're, they're trying to take everything in. And when you take everything at, at, at one point, there's only so much you can take in before you actually have to put something out. Like you can't just continue to talk or continue to take stuff in and not let it out. Like, you've got to let it out at some point. Whether that be you just write a note down, whether that be you just tell somebody. But the point is, these distillers that are trying to take in so much at one time, they can often get things blurred because you take in so much. I mean, how many of you ever watched, like, a series of movies or binge-watched a TV show, like a Netflix show or, like, a Hallmark show, and <clears throat> binge-watched it so much that the season runs together? Like, if I ask you when something happened in the season, you would say, that's, like, episode three, four, or five. Like, you don't really know where it happens because you're taking too much of it in at a time. And so there's instances where that happens. That's also not listening well because you're not giving yourself time to process. So, uh, true story. Katie and I, when we first got married, uh, and even on into probably eight or ten years into our marriage, I would get really quiet after a conversation. Or she would ask me a question or she would make a statement that that I would have problems like immediately responding to because I'm really trying to work on not being like jabbing back because I don't, I don't get into verbal alter altercations but when I do I go for the kill shot right out the gate and I end the conversation like that's how I operate I want the conversation done I will cut you and run like that's it he doesn't do that often. I don't do it often <laughs> but what was happening was is I was realizing that I was doing it to her a lot and that's not that's not good because it hurts our relationship. So I started just not speaking and just sitting there. And what it was causing in her is this anxiety and this angst like, oh, I've made him mad. Now he's not going to talk to me. And what in reality was part of it, that, that is true. The other part of it was is I needed to process what she was telling me in a way that I didn't react to it negatively. Like I know she's not telling me stuff because she hates me. She's married to me. She loves me. We have, we have three beautiful children. We have vowed that we're going to spend the rest of our lives together. Like, I know that when she tells me stuff that's criticism, she's not trying to tear me down. She's trying to build me up. And so with that, I need to be able to take that, but I need to process it. Sometimes the people who are trying to, be, do t trying to get too detailed in what they're distilling down, what they're taking in, they're trying to get too detailed. It ends up causing them to not be able to process what they've heard. And so it all gets kind of muffled together and jumbled together, which is not good for anyone. Same situation happens for people who are note takers. Your note takers, you get too detailed in your note takers, you start, you start writing so much that you stop listening to what's actually being said. Now, here's the downside to note takers. If you're taking notes, the moment you start to write, in order for you to get that thought on paper, you have to physically stop listening to what the input coming in and your brain has to fully engage on writing. So for that split second, that three to four seconds, however long it takes you to get that sentence on paper, you're not listening to what's being said. Now, there are some people who have developed the skill to be able to write between breaths or write between phrases. Like you see psychologists all the time doing this when they're having a conversation with someone. Someone will speak and they'll spill this whole long story and the psychologist will, in the middle of like a, a break or a breathe, they'll just quickly write down a note. And they continue to go fully engaged in the conversation so they don't miss anything. I haven't developed that skill. I'm working on it. Point here is, is that if you try to do too much, you start, stop, you start 
listening poorly. And that's what we don't want to get to. We don't want to listen poorly. We want to listen well. We want to be able to hear what's being taught well. We want to be fully engaged in that conversation. So when we come to God's Word and we study God's Word, we need to be fully engaged in the conversation. That means we get rid of distractions. That means I stop like letting, if the music in the background has lyrics in it, I can't read and have music playing with lyrics. Like my brain doesn't operate like that. I start singing the song while I'm trying to read and it just ruins everything. Same thing when I'm typing a paper. Like I have caught myself typing the lyrics to a song in a paper. That just You can't break out into let it go in the middle of a philosophy paper. It doesn't work. And it doesn't fit with the sentence you're trying to make either. Point being, you have to be fully engaged in the conversation. You have to be fully engaged in what you're hearing. When it comes to God's Word, you need to be fully engaged. Whether that means you turn off the music, whether that means you switch to nothing but instrumentals. Like that's what I do when I study. I have music playing. There's no lyrics. It's just music, which is wonderful for me. Um, and so you can do that. Or you get into a quiet room. Like we have three kids in our house. It's really hard for Katie and I to have personal alone time to be able to read, to be able to be alone, to take in. I mean, like, in the morning times, and the girls get up about 7.30 in the morning, if we're not up, if we are not up before them and have that our, our daily quiet time read before they get up, it's really hard to have one. I have the luxury of coming to my office and sitting down and reading in my office and no one's going to bother me. I, we have a code system here. The door's shut. Unless it's super important, you don't even knock on the door. Like the door's cracked, you knock to see if it's okay. If it's wide open, you can come in and out. Like that's helpful. I can do that. She cannot. Like she can't go hide. Unfortunately for her, she can't. And even if she does go hide, it's like treasure hunt until they find her. Like where's Waldo but for mom? I mean that's literally what's going on at the house. I can't tell you the number of texts like they found me. Like gotta pick better hiding spots i mean i don't know um but but i say all that to say like there are things that we can do that we need to do when it comes to studying god's word that are going to make us better listeners big thing is remove the distractions that are keeping you from listening to god next thing we talked about it's a personal thing it's personal reading studying god's word should be personal now the Bereans examined the words of Paul and Silas against Scripture to see if those things were true. Now, if they were able to examine those things against Scripture, what did that mean about Scripture that, they, that, that had to be true of the Bereans? What did they have to know already? They had to know the Scriptures. Like, not only is it enough to know that, hey, there's a Bible, but you need to know what's in there. Like, if I tell you to give me a verse on faith... Or a chapter on faith, some of you will be like, uh, Hebrews 11? Is it like the Faith Hall of Fame? Like, there's a, an actual Hall of Fame of faith. By faith, by faith. You hear it all through the Scripture. It's in the book of Hebrews. You'll go there. What if I say, you know, you know, how do we get saved? Like, what does that mean? Some of you are going to go Ephesians 2. 8, specifically. By grace you've been saved through faith. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, Lily has been memorizing that this week. It's been pretty cool watching her, and she jumps up and tells us every chance she gets. Um, like she told me before I left the house this morning, and when she saw me at noon, and when she got out of the car this evening, came back here, she told me her verse again. She's excited. She's taking it in. Um, we need to have that similar excitement. The Bereans had it. Because they, with, with great haste, some, some translations even talk about they eagerly, went and studied. They eagerly went and looked at what Paul had said. There was a, an excitement that they had. So when you're doing personal reading, we need to develop good reading habits. Now some of you are like, I don't read well. Okay, it's not a race to see how quickly you can get it done. It's a opportunity. It's a journey to sit down with the one who created you and have him speak into your life through the word that he's given you. You're not here for a race. You're here to get time with God. And that's really what we're after. So we need to develop good reading habits. You don't need to read just to read. But you need to read to understand. It's not like enjoyment where you're just sitting there like reading like The Hobbit. Like, I don't know if any of you are The Hobbit. It's a good book. Um, Lord of the Rings series. Mm, good stuff. But you're reading through it. That's for enjoyment. 
The Bible is enjoyable to read. There's some really, like, you, you talk about, like, Game of Thrones and stuff like that being crazy, and there's some whacked out stories in there. Y'all have never read the book of 1 Kings. You want some craziness. The queen falls out of a window, and before they can get downstairs to get her body, dogs have eaten her body. All that's left is feet. And the cool part about that was is that the prophet that looked at her and said, Hey, by the way, we won't even bury you. Dogs will eat you. That prophecy came true. Like, that's in the book of Kings. Or, or how about the dude that took the, the jawbone from a donkey and he, he beat down, not like, like threw it at people and they ran away. No, he just like waylaid people with the jawbone of a donkey. A thousand men fought him. You know, after like 213, I'm the dude in the back like, this is not going well. Like somebody at some point had to be like, I'm just going to go home and not suffer this loss. But a thousand men came up against him and he whipped them all with the jawbone of a donkey. My question is why not grab a bow? I, my question too. That was very much my question. Like there's other range weapons you can use. But no, he's just waylaying people. This is the same dude that picked up the doors of a city. For those of you who don't understand what that means, it would be like somebody taking those double doors on steroids, lifting them off their hinges and walking to a hill over his head and just dropping it and walking away. Like, that's, that's the kind of stuff that's in Scripture. Those things are enjoyable. Those are cool stories to read. But if that's the only reason you're reading God's Word, you're missing out on every other aspect of what's there. It's not just for enjoyment. It is for life. You need to have... The, the, the idea in your mind that I'm reading this to understand what God's trying to tell me. You want to read with the intention of understanding what's being said and why. So real quick, <clears throat> I put together a, a list of some ways that we can study the Bible, some specific Bible study methods. First one we're going to hit is called is an acronym. Now if I use the word acronym, literally what that is, is a, a word spelled out, but each letter of that word means something else. Like it's a different word. You put them all together, maybe a sentence. Like I use this, it's a mnemonic device, is that what they're called? I use this when I was teaching my students the planets. My very good mother just served us nachos. Like that's, takes you all the way through the planets and you get all of them together. You can quickly remember that to write it down. Like you don't have to guess, you know, does Mercury come first? Yes, it does. It's right there. <clears throat> the one that we're going to use is called soap. There are several ones out there. You can go through, and my very energetic mother just served us nachos. You thought I left out mother, didn't you? No, I thought you said good, and I was like, what planet is made of good? That's where we are. Um, so we're going to talk about soap. Yes, the stuff you wash with, but this washes your soul. Love it. Um, scripture. The S stands for Scripture. It starts with Scripture. This is not something you go get extra stuff outside of Scripture and like, I want to, go, to live my life based on this. No, you start with the Word of God. You look at the observation of it. You look and see what's going on in the context. You're not trying to look at a letter that Paul wrote to Timothy and go, how does this apply to me? You're looking at a letter that Paul wrote to Timothy and you're going, what was Paul trying to tell Timothy? Because what Paul was trying to tell Timothy is the original intent of the author. That's what we're after. Now, are there some things that we're not going to be able to understand what the original intent is? Yes. You're reading someone else's mail. Like, I don't know if anybody's told you that or not. I said it last night on the live stream. If you read a New Testament letter, you're literally reading a letter that Paul or John or Peter wrote to another human being with a conversation that has already taken place in the background. So they have already had communication, and now they're, they're talking through what's going on. Like, we're, we're going through Titus on, uh, on Tuesday nights, and as we're going through it, we're seeing there's some specific issues that Paul is addressing in the church in Crete that he's wanting Titus to handle. But he doesn't talk about those things to the other churches. Some of the stuff that he says to, to Titus, he doesn't say to the church in Galatia or the church in Ephesus. So there are specific things he wanted them to know. There are some universal things that he wants us all to know. But there are specific things that he talked to each individual church with. So we need to keep that in mind as we're studying. Like, okay, what's the content here? What are we doing here? What's really taking place? Then we look for the application. Like, okay, this is what it meant to the audience. Now what does that mean for me? Like, what am I to do with this? If I'm looking at this and going, for by grace you've been saved through faith. 
Okay, he's telling the church of Ephesus, it's not by the works that you do, it's by faith alone through grace, or by grace through faith. So that tells me today, I can't work for salvation. I will work out my salvation with fear and trembling, but my salvation is secure based on faith that I have in Christ, not based on the things that I do. There's the application. And the last thing, the P stands for prayer. It means what am I prompted to pray after reading this? Like after I've read this section of Scripture, is it a prayer of thanksgiving? Is it a prayer of repentance? Is it a prayer of petition? You're praying for someone else. Are you seeing that someone else is hurting based on what you see in the Scripture and you now understand a little bit more about what's going on in their life? Or it may help you understand what's going on in your life. But what are you being prompted to pray? That's what this acronym is for. There are several others that are online. <clears throat> you can do a Google search for all of them. There's several of them. You look through them. This is the one that I'm most familiar with. Um, there's several books that have been written on this method. Some really good ones out there. Um, but that's the SOAP method. This is a method to study the Bible. The next one is, this is a topical method. This is where you take an idea and you trace it through Scripture. Now, easy one to do. Let's talk about love. Let's talk about love in the Scriptures. Uh, some, of you like, uh, some of you are like, oh. Love in the Scriptures. If you don't have the right tools, this will be really bad. This will go really wrong for you because you limit what you actually have access to. So, what I've done tonight... Let me move my coffee before I knock it over. Good idea. Great idea. What I've done tonight is I've brought out some Bible study tools that I personally possess. So, this is one of my favorite Bibles. This is called a Thompson Chain Reference Bible. Don't worry about the name of it. Just simply know what it does. The front half of the text... I'll tell you, give you a little hint. The book of Revelation stops right there. That's the book of Revelation. That's the back half of it. So you're like, what in the world is all of that? So all of this is the study materials that they provide. So what you can do is you can pick out a word that you want to study in this text of Scripture. And let's just go, I'll go, um, let's go... Inferior. There's one that says lower in status. It gives you the definition. And then it tells you specific verses in the text of Scripture that use that word in the same ways together. So it may mean you know, you're inferior to God, or it may be inferiority to someone else. But it talks about how that word is used. You trace it. You can actually go through Scripture and see how it was used. And what that does is it gives you an idea of how a word or a thought or a theme is carried through Scripture. It's a very cool method of studying the Bible. It requires tools that most people your age, even I, most people in the church just don't have on hand at home. Like, I have all of my tools in my office, but if Katie and I wanted to do the study at home, like, I don't have these tools at home. Like, most people have them in the office, or at their offices. Um, another one is, is a, uh, a basic theology book. This one is called Theology for the Church. This was written by Danny Aiken, edited by a bunch of other people. Uh, Aiken is the president at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. It's where I went to school. Um, but he, they wrote a book, a theology book. And this t starts going through, theology literally means the study of God. So don't freak out about that word. It just means study of God. And what they're doing is, is they're going through what we believe as Christians. And they're taking you idea by idea and... How is it mapped out through Scripture? So if you open it up and you, I'm going to flip it open and it says, you know, the doctrine of Christ is where I flip to. And it talks about some common themes that have happened in Scripture, common themes in church history. Like how did church history come about what we believe about Jesus Christ? How did we get here to 2022 and what we believe about Christ through church history? It talks through that. Those are important things. Are you noticing that this is more academic like you really have to put in work to do a topical study. So this is more this is more for someone who's like, I really want to know what the Bible says about blank. Topical study is the way to go. One, uh, two more things I want to show you uh, that kind of go together. Well, three things. This is a, a just a generic study Bible. This is my Reformation study Bible. As you read through the text of Scripture, you'll see. Let me get a bit, oh, you can see a little bit here. That you see the the half line through the middle of the page. The bottom of that line is study notes based on what's in the text. My wife has currently got a foundation study Bible. That's what it's called. If you'll notice at the bottom of her page, Sammy, you guys can see that pretty good. The bottom of her page has study notes based on the text that's on the page. 
There are several study Bibles out there. Several different people have written Bibles. Some of them are really, really good. Some of them are not. And I don't know all of the ones that are not. Um, but you have to be a good judge of that based on what you're reading. Research the people who wrote the study Bible. Research the people who have done submissions to the study Bible. Like this Reformation study Bible had 90 different scholars that put work into it. 90 different people. If you start looking at, one, where they went to school, two, some of the things that they've written, you kind of get an idea of where they fall on certain beliefs. And you can read that for yourselves. That's a study Bible. Um, you will find different study Bibles, like I said, all over the place. There's also commentaries. Commentaries. Think of the word comment. Someone read the book of Daniel. And the only reason I have this one is this one was given to me. Um, it's also by Aiken. Um, this was written, somebody read the book of Daniel, and as they read, they looked at the themes that were in the book of Daniel, and they carried them through Scripture, and they tied it all together to show how Christ, this is called Christ-centered exposition, it's a commentary that points to the books of the Bible and how they point us to Christ. There's a goal in mind with the commentary, this is how this book points us to Christ. So they look at the book of Daniel. What themes in Daniel show us who Christ is? That's what this book is about. And it's, it's literally going verse by verse through the text of Daniel. So like you can start in chapter 1 of Daniel and start here chapter 1 and just read it together. That's, what those, that's how that works. Um, and there's commentaries on every book of the Bible. And commentaries written by a bunch of different people on every book of the Bible. So people have been writing commentaries since the church began. So Augustine, Augustine has, um, has commentaries. Like this is like in the 200s, late 200s, early 300s A.D., that's 17, uh, 1,900 years ago, or 1,700 years ago. It's a long time ago. Last thing I'm going to show you is an index. It's a biblical index. It's a cyclopedic index. Same thing that, that is with what we talked about um, earlier with the Thompson chain. This is the chain, the references that are in the back of that. Basically, this is the index to tell you each topic that's studied in Scripture and where to find it. It's just another, another tool. Now, how many of you right now could say, I could go home right now and pull this off the shelf. All of those off the shelf. All of them. You could do one. Some of, most, uh, most everybody, either their parents has a, st a study Bible or their grandparents have a study Bible. They may have access to a study Bible. Most everybody doesn't have all of this at home. However, because I love you, and because I found a cool resource, I had someone show me a cool resource when I was in school, and it changed my life. Blueletterbible.org. I have the slides up here. I'll, I'll put this link on Facebook so you can know about it. But blb.org. Literally what it is, is almost every translation that has been made has an instant electronic format on there. You can search within the translations. So you can put two translations side by side and look and see what each one of them says. So if you want to see what the Living Bible says against the New American Standard Bible, like you can see what's going on. Um, it also tells you what each individual word is in the original language. Meaning, the Bible was not written in English. It was written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. It tells you the exact Greek word used. So a really cool one for me, Thomas in John 20, 28, makes the statement. He's like doubting Thomas. We pick on Thomas about this doubting guy. Jesus says, put your hands in my feet, in my, in my hands, and my side. And Thomas does it, and he utters a phrase. And the phrase is, mu kai mu. literally means the Lord of me and the God of me. We translate, it, translate that as my Lord and my God. In the original language, it is literally mu kai mu. That's Greek. That's what it means. Um, and it's really cool to be able to study in that. But I can also, through Blue Letter Bible, I can go click on the word kurios, which is master, lord, and I can see every other place in the New Testament where it was used and the context it was used in. So it may have one meaning here, but it may have the same meaning but a little bit of different flavor to it in another area. Or, for example, the word love. In the Greek, in, in the Greek translations of the, New, of the New Testament, there's three different Greek words used for the same English word love. There's phileo, there's eros, and there's agape, agapos. Um, but all three of them are used as, um, 
as, as, as an idea of love. They all have a different facet of love. And so as you study love, like you consider the English Bible love, and you see love everywhere. But there's specific ways that love is used. It's between friends. It's between you know, romantic partners. It's between God and man. Like There's a whole different atmosphere of love that you can study through that. Now, is Blue Letter Bible for every one of you? No. No. No, I don't want you to get done with this conversation tonight and go, man, I've really got to like go to Blue Letter Bible tonight and study. No. If you do that, you will get super discouraged, you will feel defeated, and you will want to stop reading your Bible. Not because it's too hard, but because you're not there yet. And I say yet, not because there's any deficiency in you. The Holy Spirit is growing you to mature as a Christian. And there's certain things that you need to study as you mature as a Christian. Like, could you guys read, you know, college-level material in the first grade? No. There's no reason for you to read college-level material as a younger Christian. As a, as a, as a I don't want to say immature because it has different connotations, but a, a, a younger Christian, newer to the faith. There's no reason for you to try to hurt yourself reading this. So this is, the, this is the topical. This is super hard if you don't have the right stuff. I'm going to zoom through the other ones. You can do whole book studies. This is where you take a, stu- a book and you read it chapter by chapter and you do it repeatedly. There was a year that I read through the book of Hosea. And here's how I did it. I read the whole book in one sitting one time. There's 14 chapters. I read through the whole thing. Then I turned right around the next day and I read all of chapter 1. The next day I read a part of chapter 1. The next day I read another part of chapter 1. The next day I read another part of chapter 1. Then I read chapter 1 again. The whole idea was is I'm going to ingest, digest, pull in, take in this entire book as often as humanly possible so that I can understand what's going on. Why is Hosea being written? What is God trying to do with Hosea? This, this is a very deep way of studying Scripture. You don't have to go that deep. But I would encourage you, if you decide to do a whole book study, make sure you're doing the study with something that you can handle right now. Don't jump into Isaiah with 66 chapters right now. Like, don't jump into Leviticus. Ever. No, don't jump into Leviticus. Um, Because it can bog you down really quickly. Like, it can get discouraging really quickly. Especially if you're like, man, I'm on Isaiah 35. i got to do 36 tomorrow. I'm done with Isaiah. Like, it's really easy to get to that point. That's okay. But what I want us to do is to be able to do this whole book. This also, this method also takes into account the historical and the biblical context. So why is Isaiah placed where it's at in Scripture? You can understand that by reading the book of Isaiah. Where does Isaiah fit in the history of Israel? Did like 2 Chronicles end and then Isaiah wrote? No, Isaiah actually takes place... After King Solomon, after the kingdoms have split, right before the Assyrians come in to take over the northern kingdom, but before, but right, right around that time and during that time, but not before Nebuchadnezzar comes in and takes in the southern kingdom. So there's just like window of time that he fits in. It helps you to understand what Isaiah is saying if you see that window that he fits in. So that's a very cool way to do it. Biblical takes in the historical biblical context. The next one is called a character study. By the way, whole book is my favorite way to do it, which is why we're reading Luke and Acts together. We're taking the whole book, and we're trying to understand what God's telling us through the book. Um, the next one is called character studies. Now, this is where you pick a character through Scripture, and all you're trying to do is learn as much as you can about that character. This is my least favorite, and here's why. When we try to study a person in Scripture, just the characteristics of that person, what we end up doing is missing where that person is situated in, in Scripture. Like we can do a cool study on Gideon about how like he tested God with the, the fleece on the ground, and that's a cool idea. But if we don't know why Gideon was in the hole in the first place, and why the angel came to him and said, brave warrior, and he's like, I don't know who you're talking about. He ain't talking to me. Like we don't understand why, if we don't understand why he's having that reaction to the angel, then we won't understand really who he is. If we don't situate him in the text, we don't put him in his, histor- his historical context, we miss a great deal about who he is and why he's important. And why is it that later authors in Scripture go back to him and go, hey, that was a, a model of, of, of good faith. That was a good person for the nation of Israel. So character studies, they're very dangerous to do because you can miss a lot of the flaws in a character. Like, everybody wants to talk about how great King David was. 
David had a dude murdered because he ended up with his that dude's wife and they had a kid together and he hid it by killing the other dude. Like, not only did he kill the other dude, but he got the other dude drunk in order to get the dude to go home so he could hide the affair that he had had with the dude's wife. But David was supposed to be at war at the time that he saw the dude's wife standing on the rooftop bathing. David was not a good dude. He had a great, he had awesome things that he did for the Lord. But he was desperately wicked inside. And that should be something that should be encouraging to us. Like, hey, we're going to have moments where we're garbage. But we're also going to have moments where we bring glory and honor to God. And that's what we're after. So character studies, just be careful with those. I would advise not even worry, not even going down that road. The next one, and something that we're going to spend a little bit more time on. Can y'all kind of read that? A little bit? Maybe. All right, so I'll talk through these really quick. So this is called the seven areas of Bible reading. Uh, Matt Rogers and I can't remember the other dude's name. Uh, put this together. And basically what it is is when you come to a text of Scripture, you look at it and you go, what does this passage say? You're not after like trying to ingest every bit of it at one time. You just want to know kind of what the passage is saying. This next box underneath is what did it mean to its original audience? So the arrow backwards. Like, what does it mean to them? Then it says, what does it tell us about God? What does it tell us about us? What does this passage demand of me to do moving forward? How, do I, how does this passage change how I relate to the people around me? And what does this passage prompt me to pray? Like, so it talks about the relationship that we have with the text, but it also talks about our relationship with each other and with God. And so all of this seven arrows of Bible reading, they make bookmarks to them. I tried to get some printed. Um, I'm just going to call it user error. I could never get it to do what I wanted it to do. So I'll have to work on that and get y'all some. I may just break down and buy them. But these are cool things you can insert in your Bible. And as you're reading, you can use those as notes. So like you're reading your Bible in the morning or in the evening whenever you do that. And you have a notebook beside you. You can use the circle with the arrow and say, all right, what is this passage actually saying? That's your idea to go, hmm, what is it saying? And you can write some notes about it. How does this relate to me and others? How does this relate to God? You can write those things out. This is a really cool way of, of reading the text. We're going to hurry really quick through this next part. The last thing is, is that, cha- that Bible reading, studying the Bible well, changes your life. It says many of the Bereans accepted what was told them and believed. Did it say all? No. So are there going to be people in your life that are going to hear the words of God and are going to be are going to be exposed to the words of God, but are not going to be changed by them? Yes. Do we understand how that works? No. It doesn't make sense to me that God's word can be spoken over two people that are sitting in the same room hearing the exact same message, and one person has moved to repentance, the other person has not. That doesn't make sense. I don't have to, give any, I don't have to explain it. It's just the way that it is. Some people are just not going to accept it. And that's okay. But here's the deal. If you're reading the Bible to understand, to have your life changed, you have to actually apply what you've studied. It's not enough just to read it. It's not enough to read it well. It's not enough to listen well. You actually have to be willing to do what it tells you to do. This is useless to read for change and then refuse to make the changes necessary. Like, think about that. Like you read something in order to do it right. Like let's say you read a manual on how to, I don't know, how to bake a cake. You read a recipe on how to bake a cake, like a specific kind. But then after reading the recipe, understanding the recipe full well, you go and make the cake completely different. Like I'm not eating that cake. And you shouldn't either. It doesn't make sense. Like we joke about that. We make a a silly example. But that's exactly what we do with God's Word. We read it but we're unwilling to change. Like, if we know we need to change and yet choose not to, there's only two options that we fall into. We either don't believe that the change is necessary and therefore don't, need, don't see the need to submit to God, or we believe it's necessary, but we're not willing to submit to God's Word. In both cases, the only solution is humility. In order for us to truly apply God's Word to our life, we have to be humble and accept the fact that the Bible is going to mess with us. If you read the Bible and you are not messed with, meaning your life is not examined and you go, maybe I should change certain things, X, Y, and Z. If you're reading the Bible and that's not happening, you need to really examine how you're reading the Bible. And you need to really examine your heart. 
Because if you're not being moved towards righteousness, moved towards Christ's likeness, you need to check and see if you actually have Christ in you. Because the Bible will move you to be more like God's Son. That's what it was designed to do. To draw us into closer communion with God. With God and to conform us to His Son's image. Romans 12 talks about renewing your mind. It's, you're having your, your whole mind transformed. Your life is transformed. You're not conforming to the world. You're being transformed by the renewal of your mind. You renew your mind by putting God's Word in it. And if you're unwilling to be changed by what God's Word says, then you're missing the boat. It starts with humility. So, studying God's Word involves listening well. You have to read for change. You have to be willing to read and willing to change. And finally, you have to have the humility to change when it comes time to. If the Scriptures lead you to repentance and you need to change, make the change. Guys, God is never going to ask you to do something that is not for your good. Is God going to ask you to do hard things? Yes. Do you think it was easy leaving a friend circle that I had grown so close to in Stark, Florida to move to a state I had never lived in? That was not easy. I left all of my best friends, all of them, to come here. Except my wife. She's with me. Okay. She, we're a package deal. I mean, you've made some best friends. I have. I've made some really good friends being here. Point is of saying this is that God calls us to do things that are uncomfortable and hard sometimes. But if you're willing to listen to God and willing to allow Him to change you, then your life can be so much bigger. And you can do so much more for the kingdom if you're willing to be changed. I can tell you, as hard as it was making the move up to Knoxville, there is zero regrets in me. In fact, I am so glad that God moved us. I needed it. I'll have to tell you about it in, in person, one-on-one, but my life in ministry has not been easy. I've been in some really difficult times. There were good times, but there was also some difficulties in that. Being here has been a time of healing for me. Already, and we've only been here two months. Like, us being here is slowly pulling back some things that I need to work on and showing me areas of my life where I still need healing and I still need growth and I need to be here. And I love being here. And I desire to be here. And my kids are like, are we moving again? I'm like, no. I do not want to move again unless it's out of the house that we're in into our like forever house. Like, ain't moving no more. I hate boxes. I'm putting nothing else in a box. Evan, we were going to come help you. I know y'all were. I know you were. I know you were. Um, being conformed to the image of Christ must start with being willing to be molded, to mold our lives to His standard of living, not ours, His. I cannot be the person I was created to be if I am unwilling to be molded into the likeness of Christ. You are not capable of being the person God wants you to be if you're not willing to let Christ change you through His Word. The whole point of sanctification is this. We are being conformed to the image of Christ. And it starts with humility. If we love God and we're trying to love God through reading His Word and we're trying to study His Word well, it's going to begin and end with humility. We're going to be humble in all that we do. We're going to approach God's Word with humility and allow it to speak into us. That's what we're after. In order to learn to know God, to serve Him, and to bring Him honor, we have to be good students of His Word. Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for these students. Thank you so much for your word and how it instructs us, how it guides us, how it shows us the areas of our life that are not Christ-like and shows us the areas of our life, Lord, that we need to turn over to you to be conformed to the image of your Son. Thank you, God, for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for your kindness and your faithfulness. Thank you for your forgiveness. God, we love you so much, and we thank you for loving us. It's in your Son's precious name we pray. Amen.